Well, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Pastor Armin Summer. I'm senior pastor of the Grace Church on the Mount here. Uh, the, and also we have two campuses, one here uh, in Netcong, where we are recording this, and also in Randolph, what we affectionately refer to as our, refer to as our Bethlehem campus. And I'm here with my friend uh, and colleague. Uh, introduce yourself. <laughs> what up, Grace Church? This is uh, Pastor Shegun Aigusi. Glad y'all could be here for this. Um, yeah. yeah, and we're here on our we're here kind of in our living room. I, yeah, I, man. I, I have I have kind of fun talking about about that because yeah. I think you and I probably spend more time in this living room we than do. we do in our own living rooms in our in <laughs> we our homes, do. right? And also in our offices when we could meet, just constantly coming down. It's been man, I'm excited to have this conversation because beyond us being black and white, we've had this relationship for years yeah, where long time. just in yeah, open, honest, learning relationship. So man, I'm, I'm ready to go, bro. I value it. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, I, I read an article recently by a pastor in the D.C. area. His name is Bobby Jameson, okay. and he spoke about icebergs. Mm. And uh, an iceberg is an amazing thing in that, in that what you see above the waterline is only about, what, 20%? Yeah, something like that. Uh, of yeah. what it, of, you know, it's only 20% it's of the mass yeah. of, of what you see there. Yeah. And... Race and racism, particularly racism, yeah. is like an iceberg. Mm. Uh, if, if some people think that that the murder of George uh, George Floyd, uh, it, that that everything that's been going on, it's all about him, yeah. Yeah. or maybe they they lump in Breonna Taylor yeah. with that, or Ahmaud Arbery, yeah. but those are those are only three data points, yeah. and uh, it, but at least eighty percent of the iceberg. Yeah. 400 years of the iceberg yeah. is unseen to many, many people. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. what race and racism yeah. are, are, are all about. And, yeah. and when we talk about that, yeah. uh, that has affected both of us in different ways. And tell, us a little, tell me a little bit about how that has affected you. Yeah, your certainly. experience. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that, man. I, I think, you know, uh, several incidents come to mind that when I think about my own personal experience with racism, um, several incidents come to mind. And, and it's interesting because, you know, a lot of this was in response to law enforcement. Uh, in my own story, in my narrative, I have not experienced cases of racism with law enforcement. In fact, with Morris County, here in Morris County, it's been the opposite. I've actually had a good relationship with police officers in the very few occasions that I've been. Even the way you it. drive, right? Even the way I drive, Wow, man. that's amazing. But uh, honestly, the bulk of the experiences have been with the average Joe and Jane, the Caucasian average. You know, I, I think about several, but one that comes to mind is um, not too long ago, I, you know, I'm at this grocery store and I'm at a self-checkout counter where they have multiple counters and I'm scanning things and paint, you know, scanning things to put them in my bag. And this, this head cashier while I'm scanning is just, she's staring me down and it's getting uncomfortable, man. I'm just like, all right, like, do you know me? What's going on? And she's just staring at me. And uh, all of a sudden she just blurts out while I'm scanning. She goes, sir, you can't put that in the bag without scanning it. And I mean, it was loud enough and embarrassing enough where I just thought, what are you talking about? And so she comes over, takes the item out of my bag, looks at the screen, realizes that I've paid for it and sort of starts stumbling and making an apology because she didn't hear it scan. And I remember being angry and embarrassed mm. and all kinds of emotion. I'm looking around thinking, lady, I'm not the only one here. I'm the only black dude here. And you just made, but I thought, you know what? I don't want to make an issue of this. Let me just. Why? Because I don't want to be the angry black man. Well, I would have been the indignant white guy. Uh. <laughs> and that's part of your head. Well, well I, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think for me, it's just, I know there's a stereotype of the angry black man, angry black, and I thought, I don't want to stir things up, and I just walked away. But, but I've, had, I've had incidents, not one, several incidents like that, with my African-American friends who I've spoken to. They've experienced a lot of those incidents. And so I think when we see this, um, the, this, this, you know, anger coming out. It's not just this one event. There's been this history, this track record of just this simmering things that we've sort of kind of put aside. I, I was thinking about this and I thought about uh, Langston Hughes, right? African American mm. poet who wrote um, the poem uh, A Dream Deferred. Mm -hmm. And he talked about a raisin in the sun and he says, what happens to a raisin that's been left in the sun? Does it, does it you know, just dry up? Does it, um, does it get rotten, starts thinking? Does it sag or does it explode? 
And he was really writing this poem to really explain what African Americans had to be experiencing and how eventually it's going to swell up and it's going to explode. And, and I fear that that's a lot of what we're seeing now, where there's been this pattern of behavior that a lot of African Americans have just pushed under a table. And now it's like, you know what? A lot of this is happening. So that, that's that been my personal experience and my friends I'm talking to. That's been some of what's, uh, some of what's taking place in our background. When I, th when I think of racism, um, yeah. Uh, my my wife and I were talking about this. What what really what really defines racism and uh, sort of a general working it may not be uh, you know right out of the dictionary, but it, it is there's it's really a tendency to muddy the value of another person and and of them as an as a bearer of the image of God yeah. Yeah. and seeing them as somehow different and expecting something less. Mm, mm than what you would expect yeah. of, in a sense, your own kind, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, your own people. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, it's, yeah. Such an, uh, it's such an unfortunate thing. I, uh, when you were talking about your experience, I, I thought of a guy named, uh, there's a, he's, an, he's an attorney, he's an African-American attorney. His name is Brian Stevenson. He's a Harvard Law graduate, okay. uh, 60 years old, mm -hmm. and is a member of the faculty at New York University school of law sure. and has been practicing law for 35 years and he spoke in an article I read recently about how what he bears as an African-American fellow is uh, there's often a presumption of dangerousness about him <laughs> or even of subtle guilt so yeah. he's found himself at times in a courtroom yeah. And he's been asked to step out of the courtroom because uh, the judge or the other folks there assumed that he was defendant yeah. and not the attorney. Hmm. And well, so there is this imputed sense of less than yeah. Yeah. just because of Color who and what he is. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. That sound, that feels very familiar. I like narrative as, you know, I, <laughs> we get together when I'm with my African American friends, those stories come out. And once again, a lot of us just go, you know, we're going to press on anyway. We're going to live on anyway. So it's unfortunate. You know, we, you know, we talked about racism and, and in my interaction with friends, one of the things I try to capture because there's this reaction about racism. But I think about racism in three categories, right? So I, I think there, there's what's known as active racism. There is anti-racism. And then there's passive racism racism, right? You're going to so, need to explain that to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'll do. So, so active racism is, is those just, ex, those very overt expressions of racism. So that's everything from KKK to lynchings to um, using the N word, uh, writing mm. racial slurs on people's homes. Right. And, and for the most mm. part, we see that and we call it out because it's just so ugly and we call it out. Right. So that's, active racism. Then there's anti-racism, right? And that's just when you're actively fighting against where you see it, you speak up, you do something about it. Uh, my my experience is that the, the, a good number of people fall with, and there's a wide range in what's known as passive or covert racism, right? It, which is different than active racism. So covert or passive racism is really when um, you either deny the existence of racism when a group of people are saying, we're hurting and we're experiencing this and you're going, well, it's not that bad. It happened years ago. It's, it's not. Or, or either you deny that it exists or you minimize the pain. And I fear that a lot of people I'm interacting would probably, I would never call them racist, but I think when you see something and you don't speak up about it or you deny its existence, that puts it in the category of passive racism. And, and that's my, when I'm interacting with a lot of my acronym friends, African-American friends, what I've discovered is that a lot of the anger is coming, surprisingly, not at those acts of um, um, overt or active racism, but at the minimizing of what we're going, uh, what we're going through and saying, well, it's not that bad, or, or you know, it was years ago, y'all shouldn't have gotten over it. And, and they oh. would never say that, but in the post that people share and the things they express online, you're conveying that, you know, and that part is hard. Well, you know, you know there's a... It, it, it's not uh, speaking for, and I, and I. It's really hard to speak for for an entire group of people. Like, yeah. I, so I'm a white guy, yeah. so I can't speak for all white people. But yeah. I suspect yeah. that some of it is born of an ignorance, yeah. uh, because a lot of people will say, "Well, hey, I, you know, I didn't own slaves. Yeah. Uh, mm. I'm not actively going out and oppressing people, so yeah. we don't we don't realize the." the difference between active racism and yeah. passive racism. Yeah. And, and in fact, probably a lot of people yeah. 
don't even know what, like, the Jim Crow laws mm. were. You know, we, we think of, you know, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation back in the era, the, civil, the time of the Civil War, sure. when slaves were pronounced, you know, declared to be free, yeah. and, and slavery became illegal, yeah. and, and that swept really the globe. Yeah. But what, what a lot of people aren't aware of is the, the legacy of Jim Crow, yeah. uh, which, who wasn't a real person, by the way, mm. But and a lot, in fact, a lot of people don't even know what the Jim Crow yeah. laws yeah. were about. Talk about that, man. Well, like, Jim Crow laws. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we, we started to talk about it a little bit yeah. before, and uh, before before we started uh, recording this. But Jim Crow laws were were really uh, during Reconstruction yeah. and a, after the Civil War, yeah. and and even though technically uh, that white people and black people were supposedly equal, mm. it was a way for many municipalities or states or counties, whatever, to be able to enforce a separateness yeah. to, you know, to keep the black folk yeah. in mm. their place Interesting. and to, and to uh, perpetuate at least some aspects of the system yeah. that had once formally governed life. Wow. And so you, you you saw things like uh, in certain states, uh, mainly down south, yeah. where if uh, if a black man married a white woman, mm. that the state could declare that marriage to be null and void. So, so well, let, me, let me interact with that though for a second, because yeah. I, I think about the amount of interracial marriages that there are today, oh, yeah. even in our church. But well, my sure, question, yeah. so how would you respond though, to people who would say, "Well, that was back then; that that doesn't exist today." You know, Jim Crow oh. was back. How would you respond to? Well, there are there are a lot of people alive today. Yeah. Who um, who still who actually helped to enforce that mm. still still alive, yeah. uh, or whose family members, either the parents, grandparents, or they themselves, yeah. were victims of Jim Crow laws, yeah. and so they have been marked by this, yeah. and that has been um, the the pain of that has been passed on to their yeah. children or their grandchildren. Yeah. And still affects them because many of them were denied opportunities as a result of Jim Crow laws. Yeah. And so to either to live perhaps in a safe neighborhood or yeah. to achieve uh, a level of success and yeah. education that, that, uh, that they were excluded from. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, it's a, I appreciate that, it's a sad, sad yeah. thing. And a lot of people aren't even aware of what yeah. those things yeah. were. No, I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, it's interesting because, in fact, I got a question for you now. Uh -oh. uh, no, that's all good. Um, yeah. Because, you know, when I interact with my, my Caucasian friends um, on racism, one thing that I've noticed is that, man, I, like, they, it gets uncomfortable. It, it's been, you know, when I'm speaking uh -huh. to my black friends about racism, it's, it's, you know, there's ease in our discussion. But it's been my experience, not with all, but a good number of my Caucasian friends. It's, just, I mean, like, I can clear a room out when I bring that up. And, so I'm, and I, it always bothers me. I'm like, why does that... Why is that so uncomfortable? Why is talking about race for not all some Caucasians? Why is that uncomfortable? Well, in a way that, in a way that shouldn't be surprising, perhaps, because when when you're in one place and you see somebody else who has experienced great pain or is in pain, yeah. that's it's an uncomfortable thing. Like I'll give you a, a physical example. Yeah. You see somebody who has obviously had a a disfiguring injury, maybe in a car crash, something like that. And you go, wow, how'd you get that big messed mm. up face? Yeah. You know, you don't ask those kind of things because you're, you're concerned about causing pain yeah. or maybe they may react, uh, perhaps they'll react negatively to you. Okay. Okay. And I think also there's a sense of, uh, of realization that there is a, I don't want to say corporate. Well, yeah, corporate. It's, there is a there is a sense of sinful, almost like a curse, hmm. generational sin and consequences yeah. of of you know that's been passed down second, third, fourth, fifth generations, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, no, and, absolutely. And, yeah, and in, in, in a way, yeah. part of the solution yeah. really is for is for for us to engage in a form of repentance. Sometimes we think of repentance as just, oh, it's just individuals. Yeah. You know, I need to repent of my, of my own sins. But if you look at the biblical prophets, mm. they, mm. they often yeah. confessed. Yeah. Then you look at the prayer of Nehemiah, for yeah. example. Daniel, you know, he confesses to my yeah, father yeah. and my nation. And yes, my, yeah. and, and you see the prophets confessing yeah. the sins of the nation. They didn't 
personally commit man. those sin, yeah. uh, commit those sins, but we need to identify yeah. with things that have happened in the past. And I've heard it referred to as identificational oh, yeah. repentance. Mm, mm. And we need yeah. to confess those before the Lord yeah. with a broken heart. Yeah. Not, yeah. not with a sense of like, okay, I'm just going through the motions of, yeah, I'm confessing this sin. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been to some of these, you know, services at times where you see that that just feels fake. Yeah. But I mean, a genuine yeah. heartfelt brokenness yeah. for the results of yeah. what's happened yeah. and the creation of fatherless generations, mm. right? Wow. Yeah. And, and really broken families. Yeah. Um, as a, as a result of this, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. In fact, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's good. To, I, in fact, this leads me to a question for okay. you. Yeah. All right? Oh boy, here we go. And and it's the whole. Uh, it's the issue of Black Lives Matter. Ooh, we gonna go there. <laughs> yeah, All we're right. gonna go there. Let's go because there. I, I and and this is this is something that people are probably afraid even to ask. Sure. Because I've heard it said. Yeah. Uh, not that I would ever say this, sure, right? Sure. Yeah. But I've heard it said, well, wait a minute. Of course black lives matter, but yeah. don't all, all lives, lives matter. matter? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I sense and well, I've observed that that is a real trigger point. Yeah. And why is that? And why is that a difficult thing? And, and yeah. why? W- w- help me understand that. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I appreciate that. Help me understand. I appreciate you asking that question because, yeah. man, I, I posted something online a week or so ago relating to that and man that stirred up some stuff but and I think it's a good time to speak to that so um <laughs> you're right we, we you know African Americans say black lives matter and immediately there's this visceral reaction like no all lives matter and so here's I here's I would start that there is not a living breathing African American who wouldn't agree that all lives matter right like absolutely we agree with that it just so happens however that we're we're talking about black lives now, right? So, and I think what's often missing, I was thinking about this, I think what's often missing in the discussion or in the statement of Black Lives Matter is the last word, which is Black Lives Matter too. That's what we're saying. We're not, we're not saying Black Lives Matter instead of, we're not saying Black Lives Matter more than, we're saying Black Lives Matter too. In fact, we're really saying all lives matter. I was thinking, you talked about the guy with, the uh, lady with the disfigurement. I was thinking about the illustration of cancer for a second. Like, if I came to you, and I said, um, I have cancer, and I'm hurting from it. And, and your response were, well, dude, all diseases matter. Like, can, uh, yeah, can, well, I got diabetes, you know. Yeah, can, <laughs> but, but can you see how that response all of a sudden belittles my pain? It, yeah. it, it's sort of, it's like, yo, shut up about it. We don't want to talk about that because everybody is suffering, right? And so I think that that's what, you know, that's, that's something we're not saying that black lives matter more than or instead of. We're saying that black lives matter too. Um, I, I think another important piece, because I had this discussion with a friend of mine. There was a, a, a Caucasian friend of mine who had responded to my comments. And, man, I'm so grateful. I got to be honest, through this, one of the peop- some of the things I really appreciated are my friends who've been willing to dialogue with me. Um, and I just I feel like I want to tell people just get the heck offline, man. Like that's just not a healthy place to be having a conversation. Meet face to face, have conversations. Anyway, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, and he made a distinction. Uh, actually, a few of my friends pointed out they made a distinction that um, we agree that Black Lives Matter, but we don't agree with the movement of Black Lives Matter. All right. So they were talking about there's an organization, a movement, and. I appreciate it, and I could under, I'm not appreciate it, I understood where they were coming from, yeah. but as an African American, I don't and I can't make a distinction between the sentiment of Black Lives Matter and the movement of Black Lives Matter because it, 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 this is a movement that's talking about my value as a human. So I can't go and pick and choose to say, well, I don't, I don't agree philosophically with some of the things that the movement itself does, but what they're fighting for has to do with the value of my life. So yeah, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand with that movement. But I, I think it's important that to understand that um, African Americans would heart and soul agree with you that all lives matter. But we're saying that we're hurting right now. And as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who share birthrights with us, we need you to hurt with us. We need you to we need you to mourn with us and weep with us when we do. And so it's not that easy for me to go, I support this, I don't support that. You know, I was watching a video by a pastor, uh, Matt Chandler, Village Church, mm, and he was talking sure. about uh, Martin Luther King and how 
um, you know, when they would protest, you know, Dr. King, they would meet as a church and uh, they would meet in church. They would pray through the course of the day. And then after they were done praying, um, they would decide, agree upon what they were going to do in the protest and then go out and go protest. Right. And so but the church is not doing that anymore. We sort of kind of pulled back from being on the forefront of this. And so in our safety net, we're kind of pointing. Well, and so as a result of that void, this movement has stepped in to fight for the value of African-American lives, which we as Christians should be doing. And so in our safety net, and so it makes no sense for us to kind of stay in the safety of our homes and go, well, I'm glad you're all marching, but I don't agree with this. I agree with that. And, you know, as an African-American, I see that. I'm like, nah, man, like you are a, I share birthright with you in Christ. I need you to mourn with me when I mourn and I need you to Mm. weep with me when I weep. And then I'll throw this last piece in there too. When I think about the Black Lives Matter, I think um, one of the things that I'm hopeful for for the movement is that it's actually begun to, um, it's begun begun to trigger an awakening in Africa. Um, and I think people don't know about this, but How as, so? yeah. as a result of this move, there are millennials and young adults in Africa who are now recognizing that they have a voice. And so you've got black Africans who are being bold and protesting about corruption and about mm. abuse to to other black folks in Africa. So, so there's hope for this movement. It's triggered an awakening of sorts. But I, I think for me, when, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, that's what I would like to convey to my uh, Caucasian friends to say, hey, we're, we're, not, we're not putting one, we're not, when we say Black Lives Matter, we're not elevating a race above another. We're just saying, hey, we, we want you to understand that there's pain here. And we want you to mourn with us when we mourn and hurt when we hurt, man. You said something that, yeah. um, that that really resonates with me, and and uh, I, I, in fact, I was just having a conversation earlier uh, with someone. The, the value of lamenting mm. together. Uh, I was reading in Psalm ninety four, yeah, and in Psalm ninety four is a lament by David yeah. uh, for all of the injustices that are taking place. He's not complaining about God, yeah. He's complaining to God, to God. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. About, thing, about things that are going on in his life that, that, are, that were unjust. Mm. And when we can agree yeah. with our brothers and sisters yeah. uh, who are black yeah. that, that there has been injustice, and we, we don't just agree, but we lament yeah. together over yeah. it. There is a power in that because some people may say, well, what can we do about it? We don't know where to start on this whole thing. Well, one of the places to begin, even even if you can't think of anything else to do, recognize that this has happened and lament together with our brothers and sisters that this is wrong. In fact, in in Psalm 94, in verse 20, Mm. uh, it, it, it refers to the whole idea of those who promote injustice by statute. And, mm. and if you look back, yeah. how there have been times yeah. where America has really worked very hard yeah. to promote the dream, yeah. and there are times where we haven't kept our promises. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we need to be aware of those things and, and renew our promises yeah. to everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I agree with that. And, and I feel like, you know, part of, you know, we're both pastors, we're followers of Jesus Christ. And I feel like one of the things I often want to convey to people is to say, listen, that kingdom culture trumps ethnic culture. You know, as followers of Jesus Christ, our citizenship is first and foremost in heaven. Like, that's what you and I identify. You know, we're first of mm. all followers of Christ first before we are black and white, right? And so, and because of that, I think that, that like, I, I need you to walk with me through this. I think about the, you know, and, and I think conversation Conversations like this are a big piece of it. I, I was thinking when you were talking about uh, the woman at the well, I think it's John 4, right? So, I mean, there's an issue of, if there's ever been an issue of, you know, different sides of the line, you know, a woman and a man in that yeah. day who wouldn't sit together, one's Jew, one's Samaritan, yeah. and Jesus goes to her, sits with her, right? Before he gets into, he listens to her and he exposes some things, right? <laughs> it, it's a hard conversation. He calls some things out. But then in the course of that conversation, man, she's like, man, there's something different. I think that we can learn a lot from Jesus as followers of like, like we sit with each other. We listen to one another. We don't go online and snipe at each other while the rest of the world is watching us. Like we want to model what 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 the kingdom of Christ should be, right? And so I, that, that's what I would encourage believers. Yeah, like me. Galatians three three twenty eight. Yeah, you know, it, the the ethnicity doesn't separate us. In yeah. fact, in God's eyes, yeah. the image of God, yeah. His image, is the same. On yeah, us. and that's something. And His Spirit living inside of us yeah. is the same Spirit. Yeah, yeah. And and so and 
I, I, in fact, I was just, uh, just this morning, I, I was preaching from Zechariah chapter 6. Yeah. And in Zechariah 6, um, it talks about, you know, during the millennial kingdom, it's looking, to the for, uh, looking uh, forward to the time when, when people from all over the world are going to come together in common cause to rebuild the temple. Mm, mm. And, and people are going to flock to Jerusalem. Yeah. It's not that God, when, when God chose Israel, for example, he chose them not because they were simply his favorites, yeah. but he chose them to be his conduit of light into the world that yeah. would include all nations. Absolutely. You and me, black, yeah. white, brown, yeah. you know, yellow. That, that right, that's, yeah, absolutely, Zechariah 6. That's the picture of Revelation 7, right? Revelation, Revelation 7, yeah. Of scenario where, you know, a future, not a scenario, a reality that's in our future where, you know, um, um, the John the Apostle says that gathered before the throne of God were men from every nation, tribe, tongue. There's Nigerians, there's Mexicans, there's Americans, there's Alaska, and, you know, we're all gathered there. And, and I love that in eternity, we don't really lose that ethnicity. Lord lets us maintain taint it, but what unites us is our oneness in Christ. And, and so I'm of the opinion that, man, we could start living that now as Christians, we could model what brotherhood, black, white, Spanish, truly looks like for the rest of the world. Like that's, you know, we talk about an honest discussion between two pastors. Yeah, that's yeah. my passion. I'm like, as followers of Christ, can we model for the world watching what it truly looks like where we're not, we're not arguing with one another whether, whether somebody's kneeling or, somebody, or somebody's protesting or like, like no, like we, let's, I, let's come together as Christ. Let's represent this. I was thinking about Martin Niemöller, German uh, mm. pastor, theologian, right? He has this, he has this quote where he says, um, he talks about how um, when they came for the trade unionist, I said I wasn't a trade unionist. When they came for the socialist, I said I wasn't a socialist, so I yeah. did nothing. When they came for the Jews, I said I wasn't a Jew and I did nothing. Mm. And then he says, when they came for me, there was no one left to speak for me. Right? And so, man, mm. that's the idea that, man, as followers of Christ, listen, Scripture tells us there's a time coming where beyond our race, we'll, like we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So, man, can we, can we start to model that? As, and I keep referring to online because that's where a lot of people live today. Can, can we model what godly love for one another looks like that transcends the sniping that we do at one another? So that, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm real passionate about. One of the things that uh, uh, a really um, indelible memory in my mind was, uh, it was a while back, yeah. but uh, I'm surprised I still remember it, but mm. uh, 1997, yeah. I went to Washington, D.C. Mm. There was a big gathering, uh, there was uh, like a half million men, okay. uh, promise keepers. Okay, uh, I thought you were gonna say a uh, million still, men march, but well, that wasn't, yeah, that wasn't yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not the one you went to, yeah, but. It's not the one I went to, but. <laughs> a black man march. But no, <laughs> yeah, but, but it was, uh, so there were like a half million of us, yeah. but there, there, were, there were white guys, there were black guys, yeah. they were kneeling together, praying together, yeah. And and there was a there was a significant moment yeah. of the beginning of what could be or maybe it was or could have been the beginning of reconciliation yeah. that I, I wish we could carry on. In fact, that's yeah. why the, the the message of the gospel sure. is so important in America. I mean, think about this. Yeah. If the, if the gospel was effectively internalized. Yeah. And we were and we were able to communicate it passionately and relevantly, and and um, well, it, it's always relevant. But you, I have to say, relevant because we want to be relevant, right? <laughs> I know what you're, I know what you're <laughs> but, getting at. Yeah. But but you know, communicate the gospel, and and we ought to pray and fast yeah. that the gospel, that the the winds of God's spirit would blow revival on this yeah, land absolutely. and repentance on this land, not yeah. not just a. Bearing, paying lip service to the gospel, but really yeah. internalizing it, yeah. that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that, and that we have been purchased by his blood and remade and yeah. born again. Yeah. That's what will save America. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, if yeah. you see the world falling apart all around us now, yeah. and yeah. it's because... We don't have this common cause that's, yeah. that's bound up in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Absolutely. new birth, the new Absolutely. life. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I think certainly as Christians, we, we pray, right? We pray, but we also do, right? Hmm. Like, like we pray and we do. We, 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 we pray, we fast, and we, we fight for justice, right? You talked about that the idea. I think you were hinting at it, that the idea that we, we speak up when we see injustice, you know? So I, I think it's both and. Um, so what do you think we should do, Shags? I mean, what's what's our We're next step? We're gonna solve racism step? right now. Well, okay. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, uh, I talk about lament, sure. all yeah. right? Yeah. And and so so, 
what is it, what, what is it that, that the folks who, who are in our church and, yeah. and, and the person who is watching us in our living room here, right? yeah. what, what should we do? Sure, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, four things come to mind. Um, well, you must have thought about this. I did think about this. Yeah, they all start with, no, they don't. Uh, but um, four things come to mind. Number one is I'd say uh, speak up. Like speak up in instances um, where you observe racism, right? And I think that's happening now. I think that for the first time, it's not just African-Americans saying, hey, there's an issue. Hey, there's, there's an issue. I, I think, man, I, I'm seeing it online. I'm seeing, and I appreciate those who are acknowledging, and I'm not looking for guilt or shame from, from my Caucasian brothers and sisters, but an, but, but an acknowledgement that yeah. there is a pain. Man, believe it or not, the simple acknowledgement that that exists goes a long way for your African-American friends. So denounce it, for you, one thing. Denounce it, yes. Speak. And then and then point out specific, yeah. Yeah, when speak, you see it, when you see it, don't whether it's subtle or overt, speak out on it. You'd be amazed at how much healing will happen as a result of that. If you have African-American friends and you speak up, that says a lot to them because all of a sudden it says that, hey, when he says he's praying for me, I think he actually means it because he's standing up and fighting for me and being a voice for me. You know, as an Af as a Caucasian, you, certainly as an African, I have a voice too, but you also have a voice. And it's one thing if I'm saying there's an issue with the rest of the people who look like me, but it's another thing if you come alongside me and say, hey, I've observed. So I would say the first thing is, men, uh, speak up on behalf when you see instances of racism. The second thing I'd say is, Edu read up on it. Um, mm. Educate yourself. You know, I, I would many resources out there, but three that that come to mind that I think there's two books, several books, but there's two books that I, that I think I'd recommend um, to get an understanding of. You know, you talk about the iceberg at the at the beginning, right? I did. Like, so I would say understand the eighty percent that got us here. Like, oh, I think yeah. people are reacting to that twenty percent. Um, I'm sorry, uh, people are upset because of the twenty percent. Now, nah, read up and study on the 80% history that got us here. So I have three, three recommendations. One book is by a pastor named Daniel Hill. He oh, is, yeah. You know him? Oh, well, I know of him, okay, yes. Yeah, he, yeah. So he's Caucasian. He's written a book called White Awake. Um, and it's just been his experience and what he went through realizing like, hey, I do have privilege and I do have a voice and I could speak up on behalf, behalf of others. So White Awake is a good book. Um, David Ireland, uh, pastor at mm. Christ Church. Rock right nearby Montclair. us. Yeah. yeah, he's written a book called One in Christ. He talks about the multicultural vision of God. So that's a great book. And they do a great job at Christ Church. And right? they do. Yeah. yeah, we got friends over there. I love those guys over there. I think that they, they love the Lord. In fact, I think they're doing something similar to this this week with their young adults. And then um, number three, I'd say there's a show on Netflix um, by Ava DuVernay. It's called 13th. Oh, 13th. 13th, yeah. yeah. And yeah. man, that's intense. That'll open your eyes. And, yeah. and once again, the intention is not to, if you watch these things and you end up with guilt, that's the wrong reaction. Yeah. It's not about guilt. It's simply to say, hey, listen, there's a reason things have ended up the way they were. So I'd say those three those three things. Could, could I suggest another thing? Absolutely, please. Uh, and and, and I, I don't often go around recommending movies, yeah. but uh, there's one that my wife and I saw in the last year or so called The Green Book. Oh, I saw that. And and it's about uh, has Viggo Mortensen who yeah. plays a guy who's who's a driver for an African American yeah. musician. Mashallah Ali. Yes, I, I'm glad you didn't ask me his name. But, <laughs> but Mashallah, yes. that's my yeah. dude. I and, like him. Yeah. And and the thing that struck me yeah. and struck my wife when we watched this. Yeah. So I'm a New Yorker, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and my father grew, uh, worked in the same neighborhood where he lived, in, where where this where the setting starts, and okay. then they travel throughout, really throughout America. Yeah. Um, uh, Viggo Mortensen and Mashallah Ali. Yeah. And it was fascinating to see the endemic, you know, hmm. the uh, racism wow. that that was in the era. That I grew up in. Wow. And I and things I remember it. I remember the Civil Rights Act. I remember the Martin you know, Martin Luther King's march. I, I wow. remember his assassination. I, I remember all all of those things form and and I think part of that for somebody like me, that probably has contributed yeah. to a reluctance hmm. to talk about it at times because you sense the pain. Mm. Discomfort. But part yeah. of but part of the solution is to be aware, and I think those resources yeah. that you've mentioned are fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, you talk about the pain. So, so yeah, speak up about it. Read up on it. Number three, I'd say, man, um, if you are Caucasian, 
um, have a conversation with someone of a mm. different ethnicity. Um, have a conversation with a black guy, preferably somebody who's already your friend. Don't go to a random black guy on the street. Hey, what do you think? <laughs> man on, the, man the on the street. Now, no. don't do that. Like, I mean, have 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 your close African American friend over and 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 talk with them. Ask them question about this. And, and here's the key to that conversation: listen to learn, not to refute. A lot of the conversations mm. I'm having and I'm seeing happen between my black friends and white friends, it's like they're just arguing. One person brings something up and then they go quote nothing online and no one's listening to one another. We're like, just kind of, they're going off at each other. And I'm just like, in fact, I would add point number three B, get offline. Like, that's not the place to be having this conversation. But I, I, I'd say uh, sit with someone with a different ethnicity. To, to hear their, you know, enter into their lives, enter the experience, hear from someone you know, do what we're doing, right? Yeah. We're having this conversation on camera, but truth is, you and I have had this conversation off camera. We We've have. talked, you know, I've shared mm. with you my experiences upstate New York. I've talked oh. about things I've experienced before, <laughs> right? So, so I've talked about that. In fact, Ruben, you know, Pastor Ruben Chiringa, who's Caucasian, Alaskan, um, he, he, I think he and I, man, I appreciate that dude so much. I think he and I have some of the most honest conversation about race where he gets a sense of where I'm coming from. I get a sense of where he's coming from and man those go a long way do it over so I'd say listen to one sit down and listen and listen to learn not to refute that is just you don't learn anything when you're trying to refute and then um, and then lastly I'd say um, have a conversation with your kids um, you mm. know, I'm thinking, in fact, I've had to do this. And whether you're black or white, I think this conversation needs to be had because the next generation is watching us, mm. right? How, how is dad and mom responding to um, an African-American being uh, murdered on TV? How's mom and dad uh, responding to what's happening? They're listening to what we're saying. They're not just, they're not just, so so have a conversation with them. Sit them down, you know, if they're, and you got to discern how young they are. But, um, you know, if they've been observing what's going on in the country, ask them, hey, what do you think is at the heart of the issue and the differences between black and white? Like, be honest where, you know, be as honest as you can be. And when they disagree with you, just be open to that. But I would say have a conversation with your kids. Um, um, and as a Christian, I would say it's a real great opportunity to really talk about the Imago Deo, the fact that all skin colors mm. are made in the image of God. I had a conversation with my sons, um, which was interesting. I sat my sons down. In fact, my daughter was there, but she wanted to play with something. But um, had a conversation with my sons. And, you know, I'm talking with them about what's going on in the country. And I, you know, and I asked him, I said, you know, because most of my kids friends are all Caucasians. And I would say, you know, what's been, what's your experience like in school? And they had a great time with their friends. But my son said something I never thought about. He said, Dad, you know, he said, when I was in school, I was the only black guy in class, which is funny, because just even hear him say that, I'd never thought it was something that crossed his mind. But he said, sure. I wish there were other black kids in my school. Now, to be clear, there was nothing wrong that happened at the school, but I'd never thought about the fact that my son is conscious about the fact that he's the only African-American there. And so, and for me, I'm really big on I don't ever want my children to have a victim mentality. You know, we're Nigerian. Like, you you press for success at whatever cost, right? Yeah. So I want to drive him through that. But uh, um, we had a chance to have a conversation with them, and, and I was able to put a gospel filter on it, which is say, hey, there's been some wrong that has been done right between bad people and 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 other people like somebody hurt someone but listen we're made in the image of God we love like Christ love and when there's an issue we talk to you. so i would say have a conversation with your little ones man you know ask them what's going on be, yeah. be give them that filter of the gospel and and that'll start to um, that'll start to shape their thinking as they encounter yeah. it, and believe me, they will encounter that, it at that's, some point. That's one area where I'm really proud of my my daughters and their families because yeah. they they yeah. so they talk about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've had I've had conversations with both my daughters and their families about this, yeah. and they knew we were doing this tonight, and they were very very excited that's good. Uh, that's about good. it. Well, you know, uh, Shakes, we've talked about a lot of things. Tonight. Yeah, man, we have. Yeah, I, I, we're still we, here. Yeah, and we started out. I thought to myself, how on earth are we going to go? To, you yeah. know, how, are we going to go? Or could we go possibly? You know, twenty minutes on yeah, this, thirty yeah. minutes, <laughs> and here we are after all yeah, this time. Yeah. But, dude, I appreciate you know. I got to say this. I, I appreciate you being willing to talk about this because I think this is huge for our own people. 
you know, to know that we're not hiding from this. You know, we want to have this conversation and, and we want our people to know that as your pastors, we love you, you know, yeah. we're caring for you guys, but we're also thinking about this and, and we don't have all the answers, right? Like there are a number of things yeah. I said today that I'm sure some of our congregants may not agree with, right? And yeah. there's something I'm going to forward all my email to you too. <laughs> <laughs> you That's right. It, right. I'm going to Nigeria in a few months, man. Y'all ain't going to find hey, me. On, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation because I, I think it's important that we model that it is possible to have hard conversations um, through the filter of the gospel. So, man, I appreciate you talking well, about this. I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to get together and to do this. Absolutely. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and uh, today, this afternoon, and, and being able to come into our living room and share in our conversation. May God bless you yeah. and give you wisdom and give you a sense of grace and mercy for one another, for all mm. people. Mm. And uh, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I bless you all, Grace.